And now, two guys who survive eating paste as kids, Aaron and Jonathan. Howdy, and welcome to episode 97 of In the Rabbit Hole's Urban Survival Podcast. In this episode, more shenanigans on the farm, and Jason can't find ammo. We're your hosts, Aaron. And Jason. And you are in the rabbit hole. Safe and sound. Whether you're already a crack shot or have never taken a bit of instruction in your life, we could all become better marksmen. Join the volunteers at Project Appleseed for a day or even a weekend of rifle instruction that is second to none. Find out where marksmanship meets history by connecting with the good folks at appleseedinfo.org or click on the Three Strikes of the Match banner under the We Support heading in the right-hand column of In the Rabbit Hole. Remember. Your rifle isn't going to shoot itself. So impress your friends, impress your neighbors the next time you're at the range. And don't miss out on the chance to shoot for free and earn your rifleman's patch today. It's time for the farm update. So we're kind of slap happy. We've already been talking for like, like we meant to start this recording. 430 at 4 30 it, it, it's so it's now been two hours we've been talking but it was a very productive conversation completely unrelated to the farm um in just about every way shape or form although we did stop for a bit to discuss the new planters that i drew up yeah so to explain there are these these two planters and i think we talked about it a long time ago which were the original planters that we built were out of shipping pallets mm-hmm. and there's a couple things we've learned from this one <laughs> it can be done but the other thing is, they're really bad. Yeah. And they pretty much just immediately start falling apart. Um, and Definitely those, use screws next time, at least. We need uh, something to get a, little, a bit more grip. Something yeah. To hold it, it together. It's really, that is the really weird thing about those shipping pallets. It's almost like slippery wood or something. Yeah. It just, it, it, the wood just starts to degrade so fast. It just starts falling apart. It starts separating. Yeah, the nails does. just don't hold. Together. No, I mean even the day that we actually nailed those things together, because yeah. we were little, we were taking shipping pallets, cutting them in half, mm-hmm. and then taking the boards off of the other half, and so that we could fill in the gaps. And it was kind of a neat project, and it was like, all right, we did it. Um, it that would have taken days if we were actually using a hammer. We were cheating <laughs> and using a nail gun. Um, it's there. Should use it. I love my nail gun. I love my nail gun. Only because that one day I was actually trying to use a hammer and I was like, crap, this is taking forever. <laughs> actually, I wasn't, yeah, I was using a screw gun and then it was like, oh, this is just taking forever. I don't even remember what I was trying to build. And then it was like, oh, I'm going to use a hammer. And then it was like, wow, okay, this is taking a long time. I'm not a professional framer, so I don't really have the whole speed thing down and I'm hitting my thumbs more than I'm hitting, you know, the nail. So off to the hardware store we go. Um, but yeah, those were, they worked. They're still working. They also serve as kind of a gate mm-hmm. uh, till the chickens realized they can actually fly. fly. Uh, they did a good job of keeping the chickens in. And now that they realize they can fly, they uh, do a really great job of getting into the planters and turning the soil, which we yeah. didn't really yeah. need them to do necessarily, but they're more than happy to do it. Um, and then of course they discovered there was a giant compost pile with lots of bugs in it. So they go and they get into the compost pile and start throwing the compost pile everywhere. While there's always that one idiot that's still in the planter, basically just destroying our vegetables, (laughs) having a very good time at it. So we have to kind of keep them locked up. And so I sat down, uh, I had a little extra time today than I thought I was going to. And I was like, you know, I've been really thinking about that. I really want to build these new planters. And so I sat down and spent about two hours and, and drew up my vision 
of planters. <laughs> and I had a little bench built into my planters. And, and you decided that was, uh, you, what was it? What did you say? Tea and crumpets? Is that what you were going to have tea and crumpets? <laughs> Pretty much. But then I was like, well, you know, we actually do spend a lot of time just standing around talking out there. So having like benches built into these planters would actually be pretty nice. Because what I drew up was that the planters would be about 36 inches tall to basically build them up to about waist level to make them a little easier to deal with so that we're not bending over and making the appropriate uh, dimensions and putting a backing on them that essentially created a, an eight foot fence across the back to keep the chickens in. So we have this like one goofy roll of chicken wire that we keep rolling back and forth to keep the chickens in. And that's, it works. It's just very annoying. Um, so of course then thankfully the internet is about, and I pulled up home Depot and started uh, materials costing and realizing that this this beautiful um, deck quality planter that I had uh, drawn out was going to cost us about six hundred bucks. <laughs> this is what happens when Aaron has so much free time and uh-huh. over engineers um, these beautiful, beautiful planters. And see, I, they're right here on this. I mean, y'all can't see them, but Jason gets to look at them there on a <laughs> sketch pad. I, I did take a photo of it to throw it in uh, in, in Evernote so that I could keep track of it. Um, and if I remember by the end of the show, I will also put a picture of the sketch in the show notes, but, uh, yeah, so I don't think we're going to be doing that. Yeah, no, 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 no. Um, at least no time. I mean, maybe we have to finish the water and the aquaponics and perhaps even a quail project. (laughs) Uh, you'll, you'll allow me to, to build these planters of glory, I, I, I just, I'm looking at it now and I'm very sad that it is, that that's a $600 project. You, you know, what, we will get to it one day. There are just so many other higher priorities. I mean, like, like water, get water, water. Right. And we're going to talk about that because it has become very obvious that we messed up in our planning <laughs> and um, forgot the major priority of uh, water in the state of Texas. Yeah. Well, you know, I think anywhere if you're in a situation where you don't have a hydrant and you're dealing with uh, this many animals, which we have some another interesting bit of news about, uh, the sudden peak you come to in a farm <laughs> where it's actually productive. Um, it happened so suddenly, too. Yeah, it was like well, all of a sudden one week. It was like, oh, crap. <laughs> um, we now have the opposite problem. But that is the, going back to water, I think that would have been a problem anybody would have had. And yeah. that was, and, and in some ways in the show, I think we'll, we'll be reflecting on a few things that it was like, we wish we'd done differently. And I, I put it in the show notes. Before we started with rabbits, before we started doing anything, getting that area cleared out really would have had to have happened. But I think the first thing we should have done, which was probably my fault, I was probably being uh, bullish about it. I mean, like, no, nah, let's just go ahead and we'll carry water out there. And it became a real hassle. We just underestimated, number one, how much water we would actually need. Yeah. And then the actual physical effort needed to carry that much water that far on a by date, you know, every other day basis. Yeah. I mean, I was, it, we under, undershot that. What We figured this out, and I think, I don't remember, it was within the last two weeks you and I were talking about it, and we were trying to figure out how much water it takes. And even, like, we just have two four by four planners planners and then we have the rabbits and chickens Mm -hmm. and that right there is about 10 gallons of water a day Mm -hmm. Uh, because the actual compost piles do need water on them yeah and we went through such a long drought that we weren't getting any actual breaking down of the material because it was just too dry for yeah bugs yeah that's the whole reason why we we actually don't have worms in our compost pile because well they all died off (laughs) (laughs) like the rest of our plants and the rosemary and (laughs) Yeah, we had a lot of stuff there. Yeah. yeah. That didn't last very long. No. <laughs> I, I'm amazed that the, what do we have left? We have... Jalapenos. Jalapenos. There is a eggplant that is, looks beautiful now, but has... Until the chickens got on it. Oh. Um, had, it produced, what, one eggplant? One small eggplant, eggplant. about half the size of a decent store-bought yeah. banana exactly yeah. exactly i wouldn't even call that a plant um <laughs> but the bell peppers man i you know i've got to give them credit man they are survivors man <laughs> they are well at least that one is it one plant or two plants of bell peppers that we have left there's actually three is it three in there yeah All there's right. um there's the one jalapeno the and then the two bell peppers over there and then the one bell pepper and the eggplant on the other side yeah i mean i think we all know 
how important water for our own personal survival is. But doing a project like this, you don't really, truly realize the value of water until you do a project like this on the scale that we did it um, in the completely wrong order. Yeah. Which was to ignore water, which it really, we should have bitten the bullet and just said, you know, we're going to hold off for six months, have the water main installed. And while we're doing that, also put in rain catchment system as a backup water supply. Cause I mean, we're obviously not going to drill a water well in the middle of, uh, of downtown yeah, Houston. Houston. I mean, we could, I just, I don't, uh, I don't know how productive it would be. And I don't know how good the water would actually be. It'd be mm. kind of funky. Yeah. Uh, but I think looking back, that really is where we should have started first was, water. you know, I was actually looking back at some of our old notes and like some of my old aquaponic stuff mm -hmm. and we actually had dates on there and we talked, we've been talking about water and that getting a, um, dropping in the, the meter, all that for two years. Yeah, we have. I mean, it, it's more along the lines of we just kept throwing it off as a lower priority because, oh, no, we can keep doing this. And, oh, no, we'll just keep carrying water. Well, the other thing, too, was the expense. Yeah. I mean, we kept looking at it as, okay, we can we can add, uh, what is it? We can add another run of rabbit cages, which is, I think, every time we add uh, four, is it four? No, every time we add two rabbit cages, that costs us about... It's 350 or something like that? I think it's about 350 and that includes roofing materials. Yeah. Because since we have to build a section of roof from mm -hmm. scratch every time, um, that's what it ends up running is with the cost of the feeders, with the cost of pipe. I mean, all of the, because there's the watering system and the feed, everything else that goes into it. So every time we do that, it costs us about 350 375 somewhere in there. Yeah. Um, and at least a half a day of screwing around, you know, to go get the cages <laughs> and go get all the building materials and then we go to stop and look at hammers for some weird reason every time we go into Home Depot. <laughs> and then we start playing with stuff. And then we're like, oh, she's cute. Let's follow her for a few aisles. And then security comes. And we're back on track. Um. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's very easy to kind of fluff off the big important thing because it's a big it's a big expense. Mm -hmm. Be like, all right, well, you know, eh, let's do it. We'll just this month we'll do another run of rabbits. So it was it was very easy to blow off for a very long time, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And how how old is the farm now? Do you have dates on anything? Like I've lost track of how how long we've been doing this now. It was either June or July. I want to say of two thousand and ten. Okay, so that yeah. gives you an idea. Yeah. So we're uh, what about roughly a little over two and a half years into this, and two and a half years into we should have done water first. <clears throat> it, it, that kind of ties into. What brought us to a crescendo is all of a sudden we're productive. <laughs> well, we're not just productive. Now it's like, and it's funny because it really is within the last, like, I'd say three weeks. Yeah. Just because we've really started really breeding the rabbits. Mm -hmm. And we now have a total of 37 rabbits. And only... 14 of those are our breeding rabbits. The rest of those, as you and I were joking mm -hmm. around earlier, the rest of those all have to be culled. Or a large portion of them have to be culled. I think it was... It's 20? It's 20. Yeah. So in about like three or four weeks, we're going to have to cull about 20 rabbits. Bunny massacre. It is going to be a bunny massacre. It's, um, it's uh, yeah, that's going to be kind of uh, an interesting day. Yeah, it's going to be a long day. <laughs> well, you know, and I think... Uh, Florida Hillbilly from FloridaHillbilly.com uh, has become a, a big part of the uh, the forum and has become very active on the uh, weekly fireside chats uh, that we do on uh, a Google Hangout. And he was teasing me about how long it takes us to actually break down a rabbit. So so we, we have a challenge now. Like we have to get to, uh, I want to say, uh, I'll have to ask him again this next week, on the, but it's like, I think it's like only five minutes per rabbit instead of the... 30 or 40 minutes a rabbit. Yeah. <laughs> but I know why we were spinning. I mean, we were like very delicately skinning them and we weren't doing the, you know, hang the rabbit up and yank the skin off and and, and gut it and break it down and everything. Um, and so now we have switched over and actually after uh, talking to Florida Hillbilly, I broke down and actually went and got some eyelets from what has become our little hardware store now 
uh, since we end up making so many trips to the hardware store, we've just started buying extra stuff. Crazy. I know we're preppers. Um, <laughs> but we have now all these extra building materials and like this huge shelf of all these. So I go in and I get the eyelets, hook them up, new use for paracord, mm. uh, made some small, some small nooses and, uh, slip the bunny, you know, after dispatching with the rabbit and slipping their feet in. And it, uh, yeah, that actually does go a lot faster than just laying the rabbit on a table and skinning it on a table and doing everything else. And somebody holding the front legs and somebody else yanking the skin off. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I think I'd gotten through, I'd gotten through two rabbits by the time you got there, like in the ice and everything and ready to go. Um, and, and then of course we were like, or you were cooking. I was watching and running my mouth, of course, until like midnight or something. Yeah. I don't even pressure cooker, sir. Pressure cooker. Pressure cooker yeah. One of the, the next things uh, on the list of things to do. The the other interesting thing about water is all of a sudden when you have this overabundance of baby rabbits, baby rabbits drink a lot more water than you think. So yes. usually uh, each run, there's there's basically three separate runs, and each run has a five gallon bucket feeding it. Well, one of the runs is particularly long. And normally that five-gallon bucket will last a couple of days Mm -hmm. when there's just a rabbit in each one. And I think in total that's, uh, what is there, about eight rabbits in that run? And and eight adults in that particular run. Well, when you have even just four of those with each one full of baby rabbits, you go through that (laughs) five-gallon bucket in like, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, usually, I mean, we could let it go. We could let we could fill the bucket, and it would be pretty much guaranteed that that bucket would last those rabbits, the adults, about four or five days yeah. before it was they had let it dry. Now, you're lucky. I think we're really lucky to get about two, two and a half days out of it. Easily. When, uh, when you were out of town, I, I was putting two gallons of water in it a day. Yeah. Every time I was coming over to, to look at it, mm. I was filling it all the way up because I was I couldn't. I thought there was a leak or something. I just kept filling it up, kept filling it up. And what it was is it's just the bunnies were getting bigger and they were, they were just drinking water. And there's a lot of them. Yeah. And it's fairly cool here. I mean, mm. It's not cold, but it's cool right now. Yeah. I mean, if we're talking about the summertime mm-hmm. or, you know, we're, we may be talking about five gallons a day. Yeah. Yeah. I do like, I, I guess the way we have it set up right now, given the circumstances we're in, the fact that we don't have rain catchment set up and we don't have a water meter set up and we're never going to have a well out there. When the rabbits were at a more manageable herd side, it's a herd, herd side, what the hell's that? Herd size. <laughs> dealing with the water was a lot easier. It was still mm-hmm. aggravating because you were still lugging those five gallon buckets of water out there. But now it's to the point where it's like, all right, I, I this is really aggravating because mm-hmm. I just having to constantly carry all this water out there like on a every other day basis. Um, it's, it, and it's only time consuming because like, I guess for those that are new to the show, the, the area that the farm is on is on a city block and the water main for the, uh, for the property is literally on the opposite side of the block from the farm. And the farm's like, uh, what, 2,500 square feet, something like that. Mm-hmm. I think we call out a different number every time we talk about it because we've never actually measured it. But it's it's thereabouts. It's not exactly a straight shot to the water main because there's a giant building in the way. <laughs> so you got to like go around through the back parking lot and then you got to drag through the building and then go out through the front and repeat the process. It's a bit of a trek. Oh, yeah. So, but I mean, you've taken to just loading them up in your car. Oh, I, while... Uh, what was it? It was like two weeks ago or something uh, before I went out of town, which is why I missed the fireside chat last week. So sorry, folks. But the uh, I also don't like to announce when I'm about to go out of town. It's yeah. a little better to say, hey, I was out of town for that week. But I actually did those five gallon or actually there's seven gallon Reliance <laughs> containers I have, the mm-hmm. big blue ones. Yeah. I actually, when I was on my way up there. Oh, it was the day that I was uh, killing. S- killing. Yeah. Uh, processing. I know. Killing. Culling. 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 I filled those up at the house and threw those in the back of my truck. And then I had uh, 21 gallons of water with me. And so I had enough water to fill all the water buckets, fill the chickens water and wash up in between working on the rabbits. But the water thing really has become an issue. And I could see, and I guess kind of where we're going with all this, aside from realizing, oh, this was dumb, we should have started with the with this from the absolute beginning instead of (laughs) holding it off to the absolute (laughs) end, which is apparently what we've done. Um, 
I could see in if we were going to go so far as to talk about a real breakdown or collapse, or even if there was a real issue in utilities, forget it. That farm is done. Mm -hmm. It <laughs> done. You might as well just go through and cull everything. Because if you if you can't get water from the city, if you can't get uh, rainwater, it's it's done. Mm -hmm. It's finished. Forget it. There's nothing. I mean, otherwise you just. Otherwise, all you're going to be doing is torturing the animals. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. And, and they probably won't even really survive, at least in our environment. In a cooler environment, if it's if you're in an environment where your your highs are 80 and your lows are, are, are much lower, then, you know, I think maybe you could eke out a little better with, with the lack of water. But the other thing that I think we've realized is how many rabbits it actually takes to do a full production just to feed two people. Mm. And we're kind of at that point now. <laughs> we're at the point now where you're getting tired of eating rabbit. Yes. And and I don't I, I could eat the same thing every day for every meal and I really wouldn't care. It's just not that important to me, but um I could definitely see where variety would be nice. Yeah. Um <clears throat> I'm in the process of moving apartments and I I'll have a, a basically a week uh of downtime um in between apartments. So I know that I, I can't just throw everything into a cooler and move it to the other place. So I'm in the process of cleaning out my freezer, you know, not really buying any more meat or anything like that, I, just to get rid of everything that's in my refrigerator. Well, everything that's in my freezer is, well, eggs and rabbit. <laughs> Which brings us to the other <laughs> funny thing of all of a sudden we have uh, some really high producing chickens. <laughs> I think we're at the point, I meant to count earlier today and I didn't do it. I think we're sitting at about 14... Are we at 14 hens or 13 hens? Man, I don't know. I, I know that they're pretty consistently producing 10 eggs a day. Yeah, and that's that's kind of crazy. I yeah. mean, that's 10 eggs a day. I know I handed uh, my mother four and a half dozen eggs on Saturday, and she was just like, "I we really only need about three dozen or three and a half dozen. And I was like, that's great. We have too many eggs. I have to get rid of them. Jason's not coming up here today, and the chickens are already in there laying more eggs. I got to get rid of them. Just take them. <laughs> um, so that was pretty funny. I mean, that's the other point we're at where I think we've hit an, uh, an interesting number with the amount of chickens that we have. Cause before mm -hmm. it was, they weren't really producing that well. And it's almost one of the same problems we had with the rabbits, which is we got them. A l I don't know that I wouldn't do this any differently with chickens. I would definitely do this differently with rabbits. The chickens were almost a little too young when we got them. I mean, they were pullets, and it took them another, th once we got them, it took another three months for them to produce. And then we really didn't have that many chickens to start with. So if you're talking about eggs for for four to six people throughout a week, seven chickens is not enough. No. Mm -hmm. But oddly, at about 14 chickens, all of a sudden you have like too many eggs. <laughs> I guess if we were like really baking and stuff like that, then right. then it would be a different story. But we're not. I mean, all of us are just kind of eating eggs uh, in the form of omelets or or whatever else. So it's it's a lot of eggs. Mm. Uh, but you know, we're crazy. So we're gonna get uh, what are we? We're gonna do about uh, seven more chickens, mm -hmm. seven more hens. Another interesting thing that <clears throat> I was not expecting, and everybody kept telling me that I was, or at least the books I was reading and the few people that I did talk to before we really got into chickens was that everybody was like, oh, man, yeah, if you get a young rooster, you got to call them out of there quick because if you have two roosters in that size of space, they're going to they're gonna fight and you're, you're going to sour your adult rooster. We, I haven't seen that at all. Mm -mm. I haven't seen that one, but that, it's a little disturbing that they take turns with the hens. <laughs> but, uh, hey, you know, I, I don't judge. Um, one, one holds it down, and then it jumps on. I, I mean, it's we don't want to go too far into it. I guess people can figure it out, but we've had no problem at all. The only problem we've had is it's like we have an extra rooster who's taken up feed and really isn't serving a purpose, other than I kind of like him. He's got personality, and we named him Red Rocket, <laughs> but we've got to call him too because it's just like, well, he's just eating food. We don't need him, and he's screwing with future egg, uh, future hen production. Because we won't know who's coming out of where if we've got both those roosters back there. So we right. need to call him and then, I guess, wait for a week or two before we start uh, collecting eggs. Which that just made me realize something that earlier I said, yeah, okay, I'll start up the incubator again. And I guess we really can't do that right now since we got both roosters back there. At least not and have a clean have a clean understanding of the line. If you actually do a um, 
just blue eggs, mm-hmm. you're going to automatically get hybrids. Yeah. You know, so I mean, that's that's like how we were doing it before. We were doing brown eggs and blue, and blue eggs. Yeah. If you just do all blue eggs, same mix is going to be popping out. Yeah, I just don't know if we want to do that or if we really want to do a straight. Who cares? Yeah. I don't know. If they if they don't have blue legs, that'll be the coal. There you go. All right. Good enough. Good enough. <laughs> I don't Problem mind. Solved. I don't mind eating them. They taste pretty good. That is the interesting thing. Was it uh, those Americanas really taste like quail? I mean, yeah. it's really. I know we went on at length about that in the last episode because they were so delicious. Um, I'm actually I, to the listeners. I'm actually getting on to Aaron about this. I'm like, hey man, um, I'm kind of getting tired of rabbit, and um, those chickens were really good. <laughs> can, can you throw some eggs in the incubator? Thanks. I, all, right, all right, all right, all right. I'll do that. To, I, I will go back to my promise of I swear tomorrow morning I will clean up the incubator and uh, throw some more eggs in. And- awesome. Because half the reason why Red Rocket is still around is number one, he didn't really look like a rooster at the time. So he got missed when I was pulling up all the roosters. Number two, it's really a pain, it's a pain in the rear end to pluck and all the other stuff for just one chicken because you've got to set up the boiler and this and that. Oh, that's right. You got to miss the last time. I did. I completely missed it. And uh, I, I felt very guilty that I did not uh, take part in that. Although I did uh, have to deal with the aftermath of my backyard being covered in chicken feathers. <laughs> so how many chickens was that? It was like nine. I want to say it was nine. Yeah, it was about yeah. nine chickens. So there were just feathers all over my backyard. Yeah. Looked like It looked like there'd been a pillow fight and not an entertaining one. Oh, I know. It was just a total holocaust in your backyard. Man. It was. Because there's four rabbits in there and then all the chickens. And... Well, it's about to be a lot worse considering the level of production we're at. And I think that, that goes back to the problem with the – because people are saying, well, you guys have been complaining for two years that you had terrible production <laughs> of the rabbit. Why, right. why are you complaining about all these rabbits? Because we have all these rabbits. We have more on the way. And – we don't have any more space, space because a lot of the the mothers that already gave birth, well, their cage is already full of baby rabbits and we didn't time it quite right. So those baby rabbits are going to have to be called a little earlier than we usually call them, which I guess is fine. Mm-hmm. They'll be they'll be very tender fryers. Mm-hmm. We, we've actually never called any fryers. No, we haven't. We've we've always kind of let it go on, let the rabbits go on for a little too long. I mean, we get some nice big juicy rabbits out of it, but they're not. Uh, they're not quite as tender as perhaps would be. So it'll be, yeah, that'll be a new experience. But it's still the issue of we got a lot of rabbits and we got nowhere to put them while we let them at least get to the point where they really are a mature fryer. Yeah. We can probably get them there. I mean, we have, so we, we just called three rabbits and we really need to call that fourth. Well, we could get, we could call a lot of the, uh, we could call a few more of the Californians. Yes. Yeah. Since now we've got an abundance of New Zealand's. Yeah, well, we've got black, we've got white, we've got sable, we've got broken, we've got, uh, yeah, I mean. Yeah, that, the, the introduction of the, of the New Zealands have definitely put in a new um, color scheme. Yeah, the, the farm is a lot more colorful from a rabbit perspective because it's, we've got, because we started off and we were given the black rabbit and we were given the white rabbit and they were both bred to a, uh, a broken rabbit, mm-hmm. which is black and white, looks like a Dalmatian or like a, uh, or a Rorschach. Mm -hmm. test is basically what she looks like one of those ink blot psychology tests and that's even with only one of the does actually ended up pregnant so it was only the black doe that was pregnant and then we got a black uh stud out of the bunch and i was thinking about this the other day were there only two rabbits out of that first one it was only black and broken huh there were three we lost one of the the babies she only had she only had three kits and we lost one so we only ended up with two but now that we now that we're in production with them so we've got three out of the white doe and we've got five out of the black doe and we bred the broken but we couldn't breed her back to her brother uh or i guess we could have since we're eating these anyway but it just seemed wrong in some weird way so so we bred her to our Californian buck just to get her kind of bred and broken in and everything like that. Um, and so she's got five, but actually it's funny cause all five of hers, at least as babies. And I think they're only about a week old, but they all look like New Zealand's cause we've got two brokens in that and three, uh, uh, three black bunnies. So, and that, that of course doesn't count the herd of Californian babies we have right now. Which is interesting because, you know, it used to be in the past, looking back on it, it was funny because we would get these batches of babies and we would just be praying 
for does because we're like, we <laughs> don't need another buck. And of course, we would, all we would get would be all these freaking bucks. And now I look, you know, and so we would just be coveting these, just waiting for these baby Californians to kind of grow up and be useful. Now I look at it and I'm like, man, I'm going to eat all of y'all. <laughs> Y'all suck. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're tasty creatures, mm-hmm. but from a standpoint of we like the New Zealand so much better and we've switched over, we're switching over the farm to New Zealand's and, and kind of wiping out the Californian herd or is kind of a medium paced progression as fast as the New Zealand's can produce does will be overhauling the fa- that part of the farm essentially, which is nice because it's interesting. We'll always... For the most part, we'll always be at this level of production from now on, Mm -hmm. minus summers when it's too hot to breed, but we'll always have uh, this almost overabundance of rabbits. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, if you actually balance it out from the downtime, it's not that bad. It's not that bad at all. I mean, if you're, if you're canning and, and, and all that stuff and even freezing, I mean, if you're not going to eat 20 rabbits a month, yeah, it's, if you weren't going to eat, if we had had a full, because we lost uh, three litters because of the cold and because of uh, we weren't tracking the timing well enough. Actually, one of them we didn't know was pregnant. The other two, we just timing was off and we lost. No, it actually well, wasn't even our fault. It, we no, had they the nesting bo- They were bad mothers. They had yeah. their kits on the wire. That was another eighteen rabbits. Yeah. So we could have so pissed off. Yeah, you were. You were like visibly angry about it, and I was like, ah, it's rabbits. I mean, I I felt bad that those babies froze, but uh, I, I you were you were actually really mad. I, I was just mad that you know they were still bad mothers. We just had such a hard time with with them with, with the Californians. I'm glad that we we're switching over to the New Zealand. The New Zealand seem to be excellent mothers right out of the box. Their temperament is so much better. You know, I, I'm not trying to bad mouth you know Californians or anything. Just we've just had a bad swing at it. When I was talking to Florida Hillbilly the other night, he said he'd had a similar, like, he just didn't like them either. And actually, that was one oh, really? of the things. I meant to schedule something with him to have him on this episode, and I completely forgot to do it. Huh. Um, and it's just been so hectic with going out of town for six days and then coming back and everything else going on um, in daily life. That uh, So we'll have to get him on for the next episode. And so he can make fun of us. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I can hear it now. But, you know, it was interesting. One of the things he was saying was most of the stuff that we've experienced, he went through the same things early on, too. So it's been fun for him. He was saying it was fun for him to listen because a lot of it's like hand to the face. Oh, yeah, I remember when I did that. And so he's a couple years (laughs) ahead of it. So he was like, yeah, yeah, I did that, too. But, you know, it's just like, oh, I could have saw that, you know, saw that coming kind of thing. So but I think the other thing that we were we were all talking about on a fireside chat the other night was that somebody was asking about getting into rabbits. And looking back on it, I would not buy Friar Age rabbits to start uh, the farm ever again. I would never, ever do that. And I wouldn't recommend anybody do it. They are cheaper. But honestly, we sat on those. Uh, part of it, too, is the time of year we bought them. Because we bought them during the summer. Yeah. And yeah. so then it was like completely, I mean, we just sat on them. It, and we thought we were being clever, like, all right, we'll buy them and we'll have we'll start getting this farm going, and then when it cools off, they'll be ready. And that's not really what ended up happening. Mm-hmm. It was they got past the summer, they got past the heat, and then they were all young, they were all inexperienced mothers. It was an inexperienced buck who was having some just difficulties figuring out what his job was. Mm-hmm. That kind of really screwed us up for the first year. And going back, I would I if I was going to start all over again, I would only buy does that had at least one proven season out of them yep. that they were proven to be decent mothers if not you know really good mothers mm-hmm. that they were productive and ready to go mm-hmm. and i wouldn't i wouldn't buy does until i guess it depends on what area you're in but i wouldn't buy does until the i wouldn't get i wouldn't even bother getting started until the temperature got down to about 80 mm-hmm. and, and buying bread like how, you know, how yeah we got, that was really nice wow that was that was cool because just you took them home, you stuck them in. I mean, that part I don't really. If you're buying a buck at the same time too, then that part I don't really know. I mean, that's just you're getting a little extra, you know, a little something on the way home. But if you're already getting a buck too, or you already have a buck, then I just breed them when you get them home. But I think that's perfect because that's plenty of time. I mean, you start a week before, you get your cages set up and everything else. Once the temperature's down to a reasonable level that you're ready to work with, and the doe is of the right age, you mm-hmm. pretty much hit the ground running. 
Um, so I would I would never ever do that again. It's and I and I think the the attraction is that you're just going to start some forward momentum, and I think the forward momentum is just start getting the area prepped until you're ready to do it or put it on your plate and do some other project until you're really ready to have. It's the right time of year, and you're able to get those. You know, visit with the breeder a few times mm-hmm. and find them or find where breeder or wherever you're getting your your rabbits from and just make plans to do it then because we did. And I don't, we didn't actually, I think part of it too, is we were thinking we were going to save money by buying these young rabbits. Cause, uh, the buying the young rabbits was like 15 or 20 bucks a piece or something. And if we were going to buy and this breed, that breeder was a little high for, for what we were buying year old does were, I want to say 40 bucks a piece or something. I, she was, she was like they were higher than that. They might've been. And I think that was it. We thought, oh, well, we'll just save money and we'll get them now. Well, no, we mm-hmm. didn't because what, we lost all that production time. But the other thing is, too, while we're waiting on those rabbits to mature, we're feeding them. Mm-hmm. It, just, it did nothing but cost us money. Yeah, it did, no, it did nothing but waste time and cost us money. Yeah. I mean, seriously, at that point, we could have... When we got started, we could have said, all right, we'll, we'll set aside money for a month or we'll set aside money for two months... Uh, we'll get the the space cleared out and prepared to start turning it into a farm, put in the water, and then um, because of what time of year here it actually cools off, we could have waited uh, the next month we could have gotten the cages in, and the month after that we could have actually gone and gotten the rabbits. And then mm-hmm. we would have started with water and had rabbits at the right time of the year already at a breeding age is, is really the way I think we should have done yeah. it. And the right breed. And the right, well, the right breed was really more of just, we had a, a real, real trouble finding New Zealand's down here. And a lot of people have said it's because of the, the, for whatever reason, the totally just forgot the name of the group that it shows and mm-hmm. uh, certifies rabbits or whatever it is that, that for whatever reason in this region, the, the judges all have a thing for Californians is what people kept telling me. So mm-hmm. everybody does Californians around here. I don't know. It doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, there's nothing really wrong with them. I just, we've had such a better experience and everybody that we've talked to has, it's funny. It's almost all, it's almost everybody started off with Californians and then at some point went to New Zealand's and has said, I'll never go back to Californians. Mm-hmm. So they are, they are larger. They produce more meat more quickly. Um, and even you found one day that study that was done in New Zealand's where or not New Zealand uh, in Australia, mm-hmm. where they took Californians, they took Flemish giants, and they took Californians, and they bred them, and then they did crossbreeding, and they did every, and it was no matter which way. I think they took a few other breeds of rabbit too, but no matter which way you cut it, like the New Zealands always came out ahead. Yeah. As far as, and the way they were judging that was feed to production ratio, mm-hmm. um, and the the New Zealands were most productive for the amount of feed that they took. Like you got the most meat back in exchange for the amount of feed you gave them. Mm-hmm. I don't know what all went into that. I don't, you know, part of that could just be the New Zealands have less problems and don't, they're better mothers. I don't, you know, I mean, who knows what was really going on there. It doesn't really matter. The end result is you get more, more rabbit for the amount of money you're putting into a rabbit. Cause you are every, every minute you have a rabbit, you're essentially sinking money into them. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, and, and money being either time money being feed you know energy to feed and water them and deal with them on a daily basis right a couple right. times a day i'm still a little conflicted about once we get to that point where we've gotten gotten down to uh bobo our california buck like i just i don't want to eat him i kind of want to let him go i don't know i mean if you want to eat him you can no i mean y'all have a special place for him um <laughs> That's part of the reason why I didn't like naming the damn things anyways. That was um, not my fault. No, that that's fine. And we can do you know the the ceremonial you're free. Go go play with the other rabbits. That everyone else lets free in the freaking city. <laughs> <laughs> to, to let y'all know, we actually you have a better story of this because I have I haven't actually gone in there down there to see this, but I'll let you tell the story. Well there, well there's actually two. So we used to go running in Memorial Park, which is like a big, nice wooded park, which is not that wood anymore because of the the drought. Like mm. you go through, and it looks like like really a wasteland. <sighs> it's sad. 
But I don't know what it's like now, but I know before the really bad drought, there were so many rabbits that would come out of the woods that if you went there at dusk, when all the rabbits were coming out, it would just be... So you'd have these huge green spaces before the woods would start. And the, these green spaces would just be covered in all these different breeds of rabbits. And you could tell, like, people would just go to this park and dump <laughs> off their pet rabbits. Um, and now I just have this real strong desire to go over there with my twenty two, But I might really, you know, frighten the joggers. And then the other thing is, like, Jen and I had taken a couple of picnics along uh, Buffalo Bayou. Mm-hmm. About the same time, like out of the, about at dusk, all of a sudden you'd start seeing all these rabbits coming out of the bushes and coming out of the kind of brushy areas and stuff. And it's just like all these different breeds, which I mean, the part of Buffalo Bio that we were on was not that far from Memorial Park. So it's very conceivable that pretty much all up and down Buffalo Bio is just going to be covered in domestic rabbits. I don't think I've ever actually seen a wild rabbit or like a wild hare or anything out there. It's just all domestic rabbits. See, all I've seen, is, uh, all I've seen is just the the cottontails. Yeah, you know, I've never actually seen anything else. But then again, I haven't been out there at dusk. Yeah, you know, I haven't gone to go look. You know, mm-hmm. It's just stuff that I, that I run across when I'm doing, you know, some running in the back, you know, in, in the back part of the memorial or something. But I think speaking of twenty two, uh, and and to, uh, oh, I, I think we kind of wrapped up with the farm there. The um, Last episode, we we talked about ammo and stuff, and actually, like most people I knew were having problems finding ammo, but then again, most of them were uh, going to uh, sites that aren't that great, and a lot of people were relying on like local stores and stuff, which I'm all about supporting local stores, but you know, if I can't go into a local store and buy the quantity and kind I want, which most of those stores have like two box limits and stuff and they Mm -hmm. don't sell by the case Mm -hmm. whereas if you can actually go online and buy by the case and so there was a few sites that we recommended last time and we we got we actually got a few emails from people saying you know saying hey thanks for thanks for the tip and at first i was a little worried that it was you know wow did that many of our listeners go out and just bleed that website dry yeah i don't thanks man (laughs) appreciate it i i don't think that was actually the problem uh, because as soon as you, because you were like, I can't, I've been online for an hour and I can't find him. And I, I was like sending you all, like, go to this site, go to this. I was like, what is he talking? He, he's got to be out of his mind. He can't be looking at the right thing. And so I go look at it and I'm like, oh, oh my shit. God. I mean, there's like, even like 10 millimeter auto, which yeah. who owns a 10 millimeter auto? Now I, I'm goofy. I have actually always wanted the, mm-hmm. uh, the Colt Delta or whatever, but I'm not going to walk around on a daily basis with a 10 millimeter. Uh, <laughs> so I've just never bought one, but uh 10 millimeter was like one of those handgun ammos that it was like the guys who have them absolutely love them and everything. And I'm sure they're really fun, but most people just don't have one. That's so even that is just gone. Yeah. 30 out six gone. Now you went to the store the other day. Yeah. Did you actually end up finding anything? Yeah, there was there were thirty six there. Okay, um, that, that is one thing I've learned is is that the tra- traditional hunting rounds. Yeah, you know the thirty out six, the thirty thirty, the seven seven uh, millimeter win, uh, win mag. Mm. They're all there. Yeah, um, there, there's not really a problem with those. Um, I'm starting to see shot uh, twelve gauge is mm. getting real thin. The the slugs in the in the buckshot. Yeah, and, you know, still tons and tons of, of bird bird shot. shot yeah, but. Man, I went in there the other day, and 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 that's how I've been trying to circumvent this. Is just whenever I get a chance, just swing by whatever gun store, whatever is close to me. Just swing in and just go grab a couple boxes of, of ammo. It's mm-hmm. the only way I'm going to catch up. By the way, I, I am the worst prepper of the group by far. <laughs> I mean, when 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 Aaron, whenever he you know goes and buys something, he'll even attest to this. The first thing he thinks of is, oh, you know what. Jason probably didn't buy a box. <laughs> you know what I mean? I <laughs> you know, so he's always buying, you know, double up on stuff just for the simple fact that he knows how much of a procrastinator I am. Uh oh, I have to get to the AR thing here in a minute. Uh oh, because <laughs> this is total news. I didn't even hear about this before the show. I don't have an AR. I mean, you know that. I know that, but I still don't know why you're obsessing over an AR. Well, it's anything that that. Well, the whole reason why I'm accessing over is the fact that I might be able, I might lose the ability to purchase one. That's true. That is true. And, uh, mags are all gone. Cause yeah. Even I was going to start buying mags before I even bought the gun. Yeah. Um, and I, I talked about that 
months months ago mm-hmm. i was like man there, you know this is starting to get kind of scary when you start buying mags and of course what did i do not go buy them <laughs> um, <laughs> i just got busy with other stuff wasn't thinking about it um and you know now you, you can't it's as bad as ammo well it, that's actually worse than ammo oh my god that's a lot worse than ammo i think somebody called me the other day and they were like hey i'm someplace and they have p mags but the price they're charging is kind of, i think he was saying they're charging 40 bucks for a p mag and i was like <clears throat> that's not crazy dude and he's like what do you mean i was like do you not watch the news are you not paying attention he's like no not really i just kind of stopped in uh, it was actually jared wow and uh i was like um if they've got p mags for 40 bucks and you don't have any magazines and i was like if you have magazines don't buy them unless you just really feel like you just need more um but i was like but if you don't have any that's not a bad price because i mean depending on what day of the week you look at like gun broker you see them going for like 60 80 it's ridiculous if, man. if there's a lot of stuff stirring up in the news that day it's like i've seen him go in for like a hundred bucks a piece no i You've got to be really desperate to be buying them for a hundred bucks a piece, but it it is really kind of amazing. I mean, so for that week that I was out of town, I was really kind of cut off from what was going on in the news and stuff like. I mean, mm-hmm. other than truly major alerts and stuff, and I really don't know what was going, what has caused this. Other than all I can think of is it started to become a snowball effect of, you know, people go to these sites. They don't find the ammo, and then when it does finally come around, they just buy as much as they can because they're just so freaked out about it. Mm -hmm. And you and I were talking about that the other day. Like I was on SGMO.com, and when I went on there, I just go on there just to look at prices and just to see, kind of get a sense of what the stock levels are like with uh, with these different ammo sites, uh, just out of curiosity, just to keep up with it. And they had a case of uh, 40 caliber winchester uh the talon series or t series whatever they're calling it now Mm -hmm. and it was in 165 grain which is the grain i like and they had a case of it it was like 330 340 something like that and i actually stopped and thought thought about buying it and i was like i don't like shooting 40 i have one (laughs) but i don't like shooting it why am i about and i already have like enough that i really just don't care for somebody who's not going to really shoot their 40 very often if right. you know whatever and i had to stop myself because my reaction too was i can't find it it's in stock Ooh, i should hurry up and buy it and i think that's a lot of what's happening is people are just become used to it, not seeing it not finding it available when so when you do come across something that you're like well it's not the it's not the ammo i normally use or, or really like to use so you know, normally you'd just be like, oh, whatever, not even think twice about it. Now oh, yeah. it's like, I mean, it was really like, you know, credit card coming out of the pocket about mm-hmm. to buy it and go, wait, I don't need this. I don't want this. Why am I going to spend all this money? It could it could go into water for the farm. <laughs> right, <no doubt. laughs> but I, I've been seeing that a lot. The, the shotgun surprises me too, because as soon as I got home, that was, uh, it was such an intense long week of just work that mm. I just didn't have time to look so it was when i finally get back and i'm looking like the the case of shotgun ammo that i had bought three weeks ago had had gone up 20 bucks hmm. and that's when i was like and, and at first i was going on because you were saying um you know i can't find ammo anywhere and i was like what is he talking about and that was they had it in a little sidebar pop up and it was one of the the ammos they were featuring and it had gone up and i have not seen 12 gauge ammo go up in price in a long time right. especially not a 20 dollar jump in price right i mean it was for a case of, it was for a case of like 250 shells mm-hmm. but it was still like that's a pretty big jump yeah in a very short amount of time so i think people are starting to catch on of i i think what's happened is it really just, it started at the top. People were buying 5.56, five, they were buying 9 millimeter. they were buying 40, they were buying whatever else, uh, the the more common stuff. And now it's trickled down to, I can't get anything else. And now I'm all worked up mm-hmm. and I feel this overbearing need to, to buy ammo. So I think it is finally, it's finally trickled its way down to 12 gauge, which really surprises me. Um, I glanced over there at the Academy rack. Mm-hmm. And every semi-auto personal protection type shotgun mm. on. That's been going on for a little while though. Like Academy, that's been like that since like basically 
the day or two days after Sandy Hook happened, like yeah. the shells just gone. Well, there were still there were still shotguns. It was the were it there? Was, it, yeah, it was the AR. Like shot the style. ARs went out yeah. first, and then the semi. So the semi auto shock. Oh yeah, that's yeah. right. You're right. You're right. Now that I think about it, that's true. I mean, everyone is just you can't get a you know a, a, a an AR type rifle. Yeah. So they're like, what's next? <laughs> yeah. I mean, everyone's just getting that desperate. Yeah. Well, and I think that's the other thing too. It's the the stuff is out there. It's just is it out there at a price that you can afford or mm. are willing to spend for it? Because there are AR. There are full, like really nice AR-15s out there. Problem is, you know, depending on what what brand and what configuration. I mean, you can. I've seen some of these ARs on here. I mean, we're talking about like really nice like Larue ARs and stuff. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I've seen them out there for like five five grand. Mm-hmm. And like that rifle was a twenty five hundred dollar rifle just four weeks ago. Yeah, I finally found a Colt that was actually a fairly decent like uh, law enforcement model. Mm-hmm. Seventeen hundred bucks. Wow. And man, I, I almost pulled up my credit card. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But see, the funny thing, I mean, that, that rifle even, you know, going back six weeks ago was, oh, yeah. was like what, a $900, yeah. maybe an $1,100 at the higher, yeah. higher. I think uh, it was $1,100. Yeah. About $1,100 rifle. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't surprise me. And actually what I have seen, uh, cause one of the other things I did was jump back on Gunbroker and start like pricing specific rifles mm-hmm. and what I have actually seen is a lot of the rifles that had gotten really high have actually taken uh, taken a dip. So I'm actually mm-hmm. surprised at seventeen. Like if you'd said it was twenty two, twenty five hundred dollars, I would have not been surprised. Oh no! When I said that I found it for seventeen hundred, I was like, finally something that's halfway decently reasonable. Yeah, which is you insane. Know. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Seventeen hundred dollars for an AR. Yeah, two you know a year and a half ago. The whole reason why I don't have one yet is because I always thought they were too overpriced. And I was going to wait for the prices to drop down because majority of the ARs that I was looking at were about two grand. I'm just like, you know, it's an AR. You know, I mean, it's I, I really want one. I, I see the utility of it. You know, but uh, all I'm going to use it for is basically like three gun, you know, so it was always kind of lower on my priority list. Well, now with all this big rush, I'm like, oh, damn, I got to get it now or I'm never going to get it. Yeah. And, you know, I, I was you know bitching and complaining about $1,200. Now I'm like sh- under two grand. So what's up? Here's a check. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, damn, man, this is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And I th- what's what's interesting is where the prices are at of things mm-hmm. right now. So many people are looking at it and just go and, you know, you see a dip and if you see a dip of $300, like normally that would be a huge deal. Like, mm-hmm. Oh wow. They're ha- this store is having a great sale. Now it's just like kind of a normal fluctuation because the prices keep fluctuating like up and down and up oh, and down and up God, and down. It is insane. so strange to watch. Um, but I think it's, be, and I think that just furthers, people that haven't already kind of purchased everything that they really feel they need to have. Um, I, I, that watching those price fluctuations just kind of freaks people out more, I think. Yeah. But, and, and it's almost, there's almost not even rhyme or reason to it. Cause like when you were telling me about the, that the ammo was, I was like, is something happened in the news or something going? And it was just like nothing. I mean, the only thing that I can look that I've found or seen is, is Homeland security sent in another order. Yeah. But you know, even but, that, yeah. I mean, th- there should be enough capacity in the United States, for God's sakes, um, to be able to, to you know, account for that plus everything else. Well, yeah, but. and you and I were talking about that, and it, that was, and I heard a bunch of people say that, and I'm like, that would make sense across uh, a few calibers. So mm-hmm. that might make sense for double op buck. Mm-hmm. That might make sense for nine millimeter, for forty, for five five six, maybe even three oh eight. If they just put in, you know, a broad spectrum order like that, I could see where in one day them putting in that order, that would kind of disrupt the market. But that's not, no. the problem's not centered there. I mean, the problem is everything. Mm-hmm. And I think the other, I think the other thing that we're going to see, like with a lot of the gun manufacturers have already come out and said, you know what, we're not even producing anything else for the rest of the year. We're only producing AR-15s. We are stopping production on, 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 our, on everything else, which is going to cause a short in the market for all those things they're not producing. And I mean, that's probably the same, a lot of what's going on with the ammo manufacturers right now too, because they're just like, everybody, you know, there is no, it, it's very hard to find 5.56 online or even in the stores, unless yeah. you're going to go on to Gunbroker and pay through the nose for it. 
Yeah. Um, and so I would say that, you know, most of those ammo manufacturers are probably, you know, maybe that's part of what's going on. If it's not what's going on, it's, it is going to hit us here in the next couple of months and that they just like shut down, like, Hey, you know what? We don't need to make more 30, 30 right now. We need to make five, five, six. So pull all the, whatever it is they do, mm-hmm. uh, pull production and start making it. But it, that was interesting to come back to cause it was just kind of out of left field. Yeah. It was insane. I, um, I shoot a little bit more than Aaron does and um, I went down to the range, you know, and I was hitting, I hit like three academies because, you know, generally it's cheaper than buying range ammo. Yeah, oh, yeah, anything's cheaper than range ammo. And I mean, I, I literally was like, I finally picked up the phone and I called, a, you know, a, um, the gun range. I'm like, man, do y'all have nine? They're like, I, I can reserve two boxes for you. There's a two box limit. Yeah. That's full metal jacket. Yeah. For target practice. All right. Yeah. You know, same with 223. Mm-hmm. And the brands, never heard of them. Yeah. Stuff you've never even heard never of. Never heard of them. Yeah. But I was like, Psh, as long as it shoots, man, I need to get some practice time in. <laughs> yeah. You know, I need to sight in my Sega. Mm-hmm. You know, so I was like, I got to get to the, you know, I have to get in. It's like going to the gym. Yeah. I had to get in my, in my range time in, man. <laughs> I was like, Jesus, this is ridiculous. Yeah, I got in new optics uh, for my AR. I got a new red dot in, and I was thinking about it, and I'm, it was funny. I was online buying the optics, and then I was like, you know, I really need a new bore sight, and I know I'm not going to take this thing to the range to sight it in, so I'm just going to buy a new bore sight and bore sight the thing. I'm not even going to waste my ammo on it. Part of it, too, is just like I could honestly care less about my AR. I, I, I just... Uh, they're okay. It's just, it's not my favorite rifle in the whole wide world. Mm-hmm. So to me, I'm just like, bah, it's whatever. Okay. I'm not, <laughs> not going to, it's not the first thing I run to if the zombies rise tomorrow. Cause I'm going to be punching them with 308 uh, or 22. But uh, I guess it depends on the size of the zombie we're talking about. And I just don't know when that's going to get better. I mean, it's going to get better when this stuff either passes or doesn't pass. Well, <laughs> it's not going to get better if this stuff passes. Let me let me rephrase that. But it will. It'll it'll take a few de- months to simmer down. But it will get better after if this stuff doesn't go through. Right, right. Uh, it, but I think people are so freaked out, and people were already so freaked out when this president came into office. And that I mean, that was the first time we had an ammo shortage, mm-hmm. and we thought that one was bad. And it's nothing like this. Nothing. Like, Nothing. <clears throat> so I actually don't have any brilliant... Like last time I thought, you know, I gave out some tips and some people emailed in and said, hey, thanks, I really appreciate it. Now I'm just like, I, I'm at a loss. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, it is interesting. I think it's really interesting that it's not even a pricing issue anymore. It's it's really come down to... For, for any of this stuff, it's really yeah. come down to just... It's just flat gone. Dude, I, I just bought 100 rounds of 380. Yeah. Why? Because I, I mean, I literally—that's my backup gun. You know. Well, you're very backed up now. Oh yeah, I, none of my primary stuff. I, I'm, I well, now your 380 a, is your primary, maybe pretty much. Pretty well, much. see, but that's in, it's interesting to see what happens with ammo yeah. from from one shortage to the next. Because like 380, you could not find that last time this happened. Like that was a big deal. Because <laughs> yeah. Jen has a, a 380. And that was like a really big deal. Like I had to have a friend that owned a place that owned a gun store, like actually hold over a box for me because Jen apparently had let herself completely run out of ammo. God. And now, and so I, I'm actually like, oh, you found 380. Wow. That's crazy. It's just interesting to watch what happens. Yeah, that brings up a very interesting point. It, when we first kind of started getting, getting into this, we all got into this kick of, all right, we need to like consolidate all of our weapons so that, you know, we all have the same, um, calibers and you know we need to narrow it down to just like you know like just nine millimeter for our handguns and and just 223 or 308 you know we need to have both both type types of guns and a 12 gauge you know all of us have the same thing so we could all stack pile up you know all this ammo because of just these one or two calibers well this whole sort shortage brings a, a, an excellent point to that it's that I mean, you gotta have some variety because sometimes you're just not going to be able to get a hold of nine mil- nine millimeter. Yeah, we were talking about that a little bit on the, yeah. or John and I were talking about that a little bit on the the last episode. the The traditional mindset in the community has always been stick with popular calibers like mm-hmm. nine millimeter, like forty, like forty five, and five five six, and three hundred eight, and stuff like that. And and the idea is that there it's so plentiful that it'll be like one of the last rounds to go away. 
well, everybody has taken that mentality. I mean, that's not just in the prepper community. That's everybody does it because it's what a nine millimeter is a popular round because it's it's a good effective round. It's it's inexpensive, and it's easy to uh, usually very easy to get a hold of. But that at least up until like the last week when it was just everything was gone. Mm-hmm. Uh, up until that point, like it was easier to find a lot of the, the other stuff. Mm-hmm. Like 357 SIG, which is my preferred caliber for, for daily carry, has been catching a lot of steam over the last few years, uh, especially with like DPS departments and st- highway patrol and, and groups like that. But I think that went slower than 40 or 9 millimeter, but even that is now gone. But yeah. that did go slower. And so it was like that was easy to find cases stuff and stuff for. So it is interesting to watch like the conventional wisdom is in a lot of ways just wrong. Unless you just completely, like if you went out and just bought, you know, if you were stocked up completely like a couple of years ago, like back before all the ammo shortages and all Mm -hmm. the prices start going nuts and all this other stuff, like back before uh, the current president was elected, then you would have been fine. You wouldn't wouldn't have cared about any of this. I mean, it's just like storing food. You're like, well, there's a food price spike. I don't really care because I'm stocked up. It doesn't really, you know, I can weather these these kind of hiccups but but most of us weren't at that point i don't think i mean it, it, especially kind of at our age you know you're mid talking mid 30s or whatever and you're mm-hmm. doing everything else in your life and you're paying for different things and what are paying off student loans paying off mortgages and doing all that stuff then it's not easy to go out and you know drop four hundred dollars on a thousand rounds or something because you look at it then and it's in such plenty and you're just like i don't need it but Never again, sir. Never again. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, I've always had very particular numbers in mind of how much ammo and, when, and in which calibers would make me feel comfortable and make me feel like whether something goes wrong or not, I am going to use that much just in practice. Mm-hmm. Um, but if something really does go wrong and there's a supply chain interrupt of some kind, for whatever reason, then I'm good. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll, I'll say I never got to that point, but I do know what that point is now. And I do know that if things calm back down, that is one thing I will take care of. Hmm. I don't know if it'll be the highest priority because I do have some other priorities right now that I really want to, like, I really want to get the water taken care of <laughs> to go full circle here. I really want to get the water taken care of on the farm, but I think the ammo thing is honestly kind of silly. Um, I think it is a self self perpetuating problem because it's, you know, it's it's the you and I's of the world and everybody else freaking out. And it's everybody that didn't normally worry or think about buying ammo that isn't in this community that is now also out there buying community. <clears throat> I was at uh, a dinner meeting, uh, I want to say about three weeks ago, and somebody was saying to me, uh, they're like, hey, where do I get 9mm? I can't find 9mm. I've been all over town and stuff. And I was like, oh, just go to this website. They have it. And he was looking up it on his phone and he's like, well, they really only have like, 500 round cases and i was like yeah and he just kind of looked at me and i was like you have a gun he's like yeah i'm like you shoot it he's like yeah shoot it semi semi regularly he's like yeah i was like well you're gonna go through that anyway so just buy it i was like unless you can't afford it then i totally you know if you if it'll like whatever then that makes sense not to do it but he kind of said he's like oh yeah i guess that makes sense but hopefully i mean the ammo thing will pass because they're not talking about banning ammo and a lot, and a lot, I guess the point I was trying to make with it is it's almost just a self-perpetuating problem that right, right. we're all freaking out. And I think a lot of a lot of people are probably buying more than they would, in part because I don't think many people have a preset number in their head. This is a number that will make me feel comfortable. Like, you know, we'll take 22, which is, I would say the only, uh, there's two, two calibers, we'll say, that I'm actually at a point personally where I'm like, that's comfortable. I've got plenty. Um, short of trying to take on the entire zombie apocalypse myself, I'm good for for a long time. We'll say so, but I, that, but that's only two calibers, you know. And there are several other calibers I'd like. But I think without that number in mind, it would be very easy. And you know, there's days when I jump online and I'm looking at prices and I see 22. Where before I hadn't gotten to that number. It was like a nagging thing, like, oh, I need to buy another case. Oh, I need to buy another case or, you know, and to get to that. But once I did it and once I knew the number and once I got to that number, then I can look at ammo. No problem. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, the thought still occurs to me. Well, maybe one more case. 
But then I'm just like, you know what? I don't need it. I, I am actually good. I'm at a point where any more than this is beyond what I said I would do. I wouldn't mind going beyond it. I just, it's not a priority. It's really, really, really not a priority. So, but it will be, it will be very interesting to see what happens to ammo over the next few months. I mean, as people calm down, but even then the last one that took a while. So mm-hmm. I'm not, you know, I, I guess the, the long rambling that I'm trying to get to is I don't really know what the answer is because part of the, part of what's going on is just kind of ridiculous. Oh no. But I think going forward and getting off the bullet thing, I mean, talking about going forward one of the other just to kind of wrap up some some leftover stuff from the last episode where we did the farm update and we were talking about the land project and we don't really have anything new on the land project this week but something interesting that somebody brought up was and i'd never really heard of it before because it's not really something i'm involved with but it was uh it was basically like foreclosure retaliation Mm -hmm. the question was being posed is that a danger if you buy that property but but you had I posed the question to you and I was mm-hmm. like, Hey, somebody posted this on the forum. What do you think about it? Cause I have no idea. And your answer was uh, on the like single family oh. home front. It was funny when the minute that you brought that up to me, I was like, yeah, we don't, well, or at least we're not suspecting. Um, it's not the people that were there that are being foreclosed on anymore. It's the people that are actually monitoring the lists and seeing which ones are getting foreclosed on and their prime ripe targets to go and rip out copper. Uh, we've had four properties that uh, I can think of just off the top of my head that we went and out and inspected them and, you know, and, and the homeowners were there and three or four days after the, um, actual foreclosure, we drove by, back by and someone ran through the, through the actual garage and ripped every piece of copper out. The ACs were gone. All the, all the copper of the entire AC system. They ripped it out of the attic uh, and all this. And they, of course, they're not being delicate. Well, of course not. So they're tearing the living hell out of everything. We're talking about two, two by four studs, ripping up sheetrock. There's insulation all over. We're talking about, there was a $100,000 house. This is the one that I just analyzed the numbers. Re- resale value, if it was, it was, if it was repaired, in, in, in the industry we call it ARV, after repaired value, about $100,000. We pick it up at the foreclosure because we just inspected it and it looked in really good in condition. Mm. So we paid a little a bit of a premium for it. So we bought it for $40,000. When we went back and this thing was got completely ripped out, all of our estimates are all like $60,000. Oh, wow. So we're talking best case scenario, break even. Mm-hmm. Very, very bad, 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 bad. Yeah. So we're not, ha- we're not seeing the retaliation. We're seeing... Because it's being foreclosed on, it's being targeted by thieves. By thieves. Yeah. Now, now rolling back to, I guess, more of, uh, of what we would talk about as far as, you know, buying agricultural land. Mm. Well, there's not really a whole lot to mess up. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's the improved type properties where you're going to see some vandalism and some theft. And you had said something about really when you see the the retaliations, it's usually like the day or two before those people... Uh, who are being foreclosed on get mm-hmm. kicked out? That's when they go rip things out and tear things up. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but you know, I'm just not seeing it from the foreclosure side. Mm. Now, I'm I'm speaking of this from experience. Mm. Well, but I also need to throw into that caveat is the fact that we mainly do tax sales. Yeah, you know, we don't do a whole lot of mortgage, you know, foreclosures. Just because I'm not seeing it, you know, I'm not saying that it's not occurring. But I'm also not hearing it from any other of the other real estate investors as well. Um, they're talking more along the lines of theft. Huh. But I think what really speaking to the question is something that it didn't sound like you'd ever heard of, of somebody coming back to the new buyers mm-hmm. and, and doing anything. No, no. Yeah. I haven't. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's probably one person one somewhere someday that did do it, but they were probably out of their gourd to begin with, and right, pro- extremely isolated. If it did, if it did ever even occur, so yeah. As far as being apprehensive about that, the chances of that occurring is actually being robbed at gunpoint. <laughs> yeah, and with that, we wrap up episode ninety-seven. Thank you for joining us today. In the rabbit hole isn't just a podcast and a blog; it's also a community. The best way to connect to that community is by joining me and the other rabbit holers on the In the Rabbit Hole forum at forum.intherabbithole.com. Remember, survival chi starts with community. So come join me 
at forum.intherabbithole.com and let's talk about all things preparedness. Are you part of the solution? Spread the word about preparedness by reviewing In the Rabbit Hole on iTunes. It doesn't just let us know how we're doing. It also tells others the show is worth listening to. Review us today on iTunes. From the Lone Star State, till next time, stay safe and sound.